Hey everybody, how you doing today? This is Dr. Joshua Fredenberg. I'm so happy to see all of you this afternoon as we're getting ready to dive into this incredible virtual masterclass with some incredible panelists. I'm so thrilled and excited to be here today. And for those of you that are joining us today, if you can just represent where, where you are. So wherever you're coming from, if you can just let us know in the chat box, we always like to represent. So wherever you're coming from across the country, would love to know where you are coming from. So please feel free to uh, just represent. Let us know where you're coming from. Let us know what school you're coming from. Let us know what state you're coming from as well. I see St. Louis. I see South Carolina, Tennessee's in the house. Texas, Arizona, Oregon State, Tampa, California, New Jersey, Florida again, Louisiana. Welcome all of you from all across the country. We're so excited to have you here today. For those that may not know who I am, Mike, if you could put up the PowerPoint, that'd be awesome. But for those that don't know who I am, my name is Dr. Joshua Fredenberg, and I am a national speaker. I am an author of seven books and president of the Circle of Change Leadership Conference, which ultimately is the sponsor of these virtual master classes. For those of you that may not be familiar with the Circle of Change Leadership Conference, we are a national conference that has three goals. Number one, to help students discover the leader from within. Number two, to develop the professional and leadership skills necessary to position them for career leadership success after graduation. And number three, the inspiration and the confidence to go out there and make an impact in their community, their nation, and their world. And so our target is culturally diverse and first generation students. Um, we just celebrated 10 years and because of COVID-19, uh, we've had to pivot. And so we're actually doing our national conference this year virtually. And so if you have not checked us out yet, we want to encourage you to do so. But we're doing a virtual Circle of Change Leadership Conference this November and December. Yes, it is going to be two weekends and six days. Uh, people have asked me, why is it six days? Well, it's six days because we want to spread it out so people don't get Zoom fatigue. But number two, we want to make it accessible and give more content, more value, and more importantly, more impact to students and professionals that want to get involved. If you're interested, we just put in the chat box. You can visit the website or you can fill out a Google Docs and we can get set up a meeting with you to talk to you more about the conference. But it's going to be amazing. It's going to be incredible. I encourage you. Uh, if you're looking for a virtual experience for your students, I encourage you to check it out and to register. Again, we have a great economical rate. Um, I know it's going to be amazing. I know it's going to be outstanding. So I'm just encouraging you uh, to consider joining us this fall. Uh, it's going to be virtual, but it's definitely going to be different. It's definitely going to be out the box. And it's not going to just be a lecture. It's going to be interactive. It's going to be engaging. And we have a lot of fun and exciting things that we have planned, not only for students, but professionals as well. So make sure you uh, lock in as well. And some of our panelists will be there as well. So some of the people you're going to hear to speak today are also, are also going to be featured there as well. So we're excited about that. Uh, Again, spread the word, you know, let people know about it, get the word out uh, again, because we are trying to reach as many students as possible and professionals during these challenging times within our community, our nation and our world. Now, before we get started, we're going to open up with a poll. And I wanted to do a poll to begin with, because I just want to get an idea of, you know, what what your challenges are as it relates to fraternity and sorority students. So for some, is it is it recruitment, intake or retention? For some, it may be leadership development programming. Is it the integration of diversity, inclusion, and equity training? Is it advising in the midst of a pandemic? Or maybe is it building relationships with your students virtually? So we have a poll right now, and literally recruitment, intake, and retention is leading. But here comes DEI. It's coming very, very close. Uh, but intake still, 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 still doing it right there. So uh, my panel knows what to talk about. Advising the pandemic is is trying to bring a little here, but it just looks like the most the most popular topic that seemed to come up with our audience today seemed to be recruitment, intake, and retention, and then it's followed by integrating DEI uh, within your trainings and then advising during a pandemic. So I want to thank you all so much for participating in the poll. And again, the reason why we're doing that is because we're here, number one, to serve you. You are the most important person today. We want to provide you with as much value that we can that enable you not only to do your job at a high level, but more importantly, to make a positive impact in the lives of your students. So I'm excited to be here today. It's going to be fun. Make sure you interact. Make sure you engage. Make sure you represent uh, but without further ado, I get the wonderful opportunity to introduce our amazing panelists and speakers. I believe that these are some of the top 
speakers and experts when it comes to fraternity and sorority life in the country. Uh, I really do believe that with all my heart, and they're going to share some incredible knowledge today. And so I'm just, I'm just like you. Know, I can't wait to sit here and learn and you know give my comments here and there, but more so hear what they had to say because they're all incredible. They're all amazing. So I'm going to start with my first panelist. Uh, she's no stranger to our virtual master classes. She's been here a couple of times and done an incredible job. Dr. Vanessa Busamante, if you can introduce yourself and let us know who is one person that has been inspiring you over the past three to six months. It's in your hands, doctor. Hi, everyone. I'm happy to be here with all of you today. Again, my name is Vanessa. Bustamante. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm coming to y'all live from California, um, Oceanside area. And uh, one person that's been inspirational to me or inspiring me is um, Huey P. Newton. So I've been um, really involved in reading Huey P. Newton's reader as of late and um, just getting really inspired to um, build new movements and um, revolutionize not just education, but also um, revolutionize our thinking uh, with consciousness. So uh, that's really been um, in my mind and in my heart lately. Um, I am a founding sister of the Delta Omega chapter of Lambda Theta Alpha Latin Sorority Incorporated um, at Cal State Northridge. So um, my background is in fraternity and sorority life and I do have published research on fraternity and sorority life most uh, dealing with historically multicultural fraternities and sororities. I say historically multicultural because that is something that I did introduce in my research uh, through a critical race theory lens. So I'm actually really, really happy to be here today. I love fraternity and sorority life, and I'm happy to share the space with these great panelists. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Busamante. Make sure you give her a big round of applause and a shout out. And I'm noticing my shirt is sparkling. I don't know if it's a shirt I wore. I don't know. But hey, we're having a party. Why not? <laughs> uh, but our next panelist is no stranger. Oh, man, this is an incredible woman. Um, she, she's incredible in so many different ways. Uh, would you please give a big warm welcome to Tania Lowry? Tania, welcome. Introduce yourself. And who's been most inspirational to you? over these past three to six months. Welcome to Nia. One of the things we're going to talk about is technology. You got to unmute yourself, first of all. <laughs> Let's just start there. Um, and so with that, um, my name is Tania Lari. Um, well, Tania McGee, I've recently gotten married. And I serve as the assistant director for the Office of Sorority Fraternity Life here at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. I've been in higher ed for about 14 years now. I saw one of my fellow Mean Green um, representation here. I got my undergrad from the University of North Texas, and I got my master's degree from Clark Atlanta University. So I've been in the field for about 14 years working with cultural-based fraternities and sororities primarily in different capacities, having background with first-generation college students, multicultural affair, and multicultural fraternal organizations. And so I find myself in different capacities now, bridging gaps between all four councils through the competency lens of cultural humility, or just um, having that foundation of understanding on how we can lean in more intentionally. And so definitely excited to be here for the conversations that are going to happen today. Oh, an inspiring person. Eric Thomas. I heard one of his, if you listen to Eric Thomas, you will understand exactly what I'm talking about. He is a phenomenal motivational speaker, but one of his um, videos, he was talking about, you have, you can't be stuck. And we understand that we're in a pandemic from a health disparity, but also from the isms, racism, sexism, biases, and things like that. And he was saying that you can't get stuck in that moment. And so I've been really trying to work with my students to become unstuck and to be able to engage beyond this vocal world that we live in. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tania. It's so good to have you there. We're going to give you a big round of applause virtually as well. Uh, our next panelist, he's no stranger, lives five to seven minutes away from me. He's been on multiple virtual master classes. He's a member of the greatest fraternity in the world, Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. Give it up for Jared Benjamin. Thank you so much, Josh. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, my background is a mixing pot of student affairs and cybersecurity. Uh, I work at FIU. I'm the Cyber Apprenticeship Program Director. Uh, I have experience in fraternity and sorority life. I had the privilege of serving on our general board. Uh, 2015 to 2017 as an international vice president of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. Um, some of the things I'm working on is exploring and, and examining cyber hygiene 
of our uh, culture-based fraternity organizations during this time while we're in a virtual capacity, ensuring they know the safe practices on as we virtualize our programming, as we virtualize our recruitment efforts, and as we, we fight to be relevant in, in a time that was just un, unprecedented. Um, as my, my, my um, who do I look to right now? Um, he's no longer with us, but Congressman John Lewis, uh, I found it so moving that he would write a letter knowing that he wouldn't be with us any longer, challenging and charging us to be the best version of us. Uh, when I joined Phi Beta Sigma, I made a decision early on that I didn't want to be a famous Sigma, but I wanted to be a notable Sigma. And so I knew so many famous Sigmas uh, by virtue of them being athletes or by virtue of them uh, being uh, celebrities, but I wanted to focus on being notable. So I made a mark as a neophyte brother, fresh into Phi Beta Sigma, what can I do to leave a notable mark? And I truly believe Congressman John Lewis um, left a notable mark, not only in Phi Beta Sigma, but in uh, civic activism, in uh, public service, and also uh, for human rights. Awesome. Give Jed a big virtual welcome. Thank you so much again, Jed, for being a part of these virtual masterclasses from the beginning. Uh, our next panelist, uh, this is her first time being on one of these virtual masterclasses, but she's no stranger. She does incredible work all throughout the country as a speaker, a consultant, and so many other wonderful things as well. Also does a conference. Uh, could you please give a big round of applause for Dr. Suzette Walden Cole. Welcome, Dr. Cole. Introduce yourself. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I uh, I will offer that um, my name is Dr. Suzette Walden Cole, which I shared. I serve as a speaker and consultant, global educator, have had the opportunity to travel the world doing leadership education. Uh, been leaning in lately to um, how we can do better, right? What are the things that we have to unlearn? in order to create space to be able to do better. And uh, Maya Angelou is a person who continues to inspire me even though she no longer walks the earth, her words transcend her lifetime in this space. And to know that when we know better, we do better requires us to think about what that looks like. And so worked on a college campus for a number of years, transitioned about seven years ago to the full-time speaker and consultant role, uh, work with as, as a senior partner for the CCFAI Collaborative, which is a group of humans that came together to lean in and elevate and amplify the work of our culturally based fraternal organizations, as well as started changing the dynamic of the conversations that our Panhellenic organizations were having around diversity, equity, and inclusion, and creating an institute designed to help professionals at the national level as well as at the conference level to be able to address those things and I am so thrilled to be a part and so humbled to be a part of this dynamic panel of humans Josh that you've assembled it's my pleasure to be here Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Cole. Give Dr. Cole a big round of applause. Awesome in virtual land. And our last uh, panelist, she's no stranger. Man, we've been riding for about 14 plus years. She's like my other sister. Can y'all give it up for T.I. Tish Norman. Welcome, Tish. Introduce yourself and all that good stuff. Hey, everybody, listen, I'm shaking the table. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> Shout out to Vanessa Bustamante for bringing me to CSUN like five years ago. <laughs> Shout out to Jared Benjamin for just coming in wrecking shop. Shout out to my Calvin Klein dress wearing sister in uh, uh, Nashville, Tennessee, Chattanooga, somewhere. Shout out to my brother from another mother. Uh, Josh Fredenberg, I, I met him in 2004 and ain't been able to get rid of him since then. I go one place, he follows me. Shout out to Suzette. I thought I heard her in another room at another conference and I walked in and I was surprised that she had a side cut like I did. I was like, you got a business, is that right? What's up, everybody? Man, I'm so glad to be here. I'm so glad to be a part of this conversation, the ongoing conversation. You guys are looking at a veteran in this game. Can I? Can we say veteran, Josh? Can we say vets? <laughs> hey, that's fine. You know, I like I like seasoned better. I like seasoned, but you know, seasoned, that's just fine. Seasoned professionals. That's what it is. So as Josh uh, brought all of these other speakers to the table, I do want to say hello and welcome to everybody. I am a uh, speaker. I am an author. I am 
the founder of Transforming Leaders Now, which is an educational uh, consulting firm uh, that has afforded me the privilege to keynote at the leading Greek leadership conferences all over the country that has allowed me to speak in 45 of the 50 states and 14 countries across the globe. And so I'm so excited to be able to share what I like to call the amalgamation of education and motivation. <laughs> if I got any real true hip hop fans in the building, <laughs> Uh, you know that KRS One released an album in 1990 called Edutainment, the mixture of education yeah. and entertainment. Well, I like to make a mixture of education and motivation. So I'm going to be bringing that flavor today because too many times we focus on the ABCs and the one, two, threes and policy and strategy, but we forget why we should do what we do. And so I'm going to be bringing and sharing a little bit of my perspective um, in there. Uh, in this conversation tonight. Um, as Josh mentioned, before I give it right over to him, I'm a speaker and I've just recently started a three-part series called Women Speaking to Women. And tonight mm. at seven o'clock, I am hosting a virtual community conversation among sorors. It is open to the public. It is not an Alpha Kappa Alpha event, even though I will give a shameless plug and say, everybody <laughs> make sure they get to the polls and vote. Um, but it will be a conversation among the women tonight, speaking to women on topics like self-care, women's empowerment, cultural integrity, and so much more. And then next month, I'll be doing the same, but we'll be celebrating Women's Heritage, uh, Latino Heritage Month on September 8th. So if y'all connect with me on LinkedIn, you'll be able to see all the stuff coming up. I'm going to talk to you in a few minutes. Awesome. Awesome. Nadine ready to sign up too. So you better put in the chat box. Nadine ready to sign up. I just saw that come up in the chat. So a wonderful introduction. Thank you so much for energy again. Uh, I think she said a great point about your why. And that's what we want to do. We want to, we want to, we want to, we want to spark your why. These are challenging times right now uh, for all of us. And I just want to commend you that are, that are opening back up. Those of you on campuses right now that are working, I just want to just let you know, uh, not only are you in my thoughts, but you're in my prayers. And I just want to commend you on your work. I know it's challenging every single day in the midst of a of a pandemic and a variety of other things that are going on. So we just want to let you know that we care about you. Um, we're concerned about you. And really, the reason we're doing this is because this is really about you. We want to empower you. We want to motivate you. We want to inspire you. So uh, again, thank you so much for uh, tuning in today, giving us an hour and a half of your time. I'm not going to waste any time because we got to get right into it. But one thing I do want to say, um, as each person was introduced, there is a LinkedIn link that's showing up in the chat under each person. So if you want to connect with them on LinkedIn, you are free to click and be able to connect with them as well. I'm a firm believer. Uh, good people know good people. And I believe all of us are good people and we're all connected to one another. So it's just important to be connected, especially during these times uh, digitally, because you never know who you need to know, who you need to talk to, or who may have a sense of inspiration during these times. But I'm excited today. I'm not going to waste no time. I'm getting right into the question. Uh, first question we're coming about is we're going to talk about virtual programming. Obviously, um, regardless of where you work, regardless of where you are at in this nation, virtual programming is a is a require is it really a necessity is something that has to be implemented. And there are challenges as well as solutions to those challenges, especially as it relates to Greek life. And so, uh, Tania, I'm going to start with you, then I'm going to let it just open itself up. I want to ask you, Tania, right off the bat, you're working at the University of Tennessee. Y'all start school today. you got a big event coming up tomorrow. I already saw on the Facebook page. What have you saw as the greatest challenges virtually for fraternity and sorority life? And then what are some of the solutions to those challenges that you've either implemented or that you've heard other people talk about as well? It's in your hands. All right, I'm gonna catch it. And I'm gonna dribble it, I'm gonna pass it to some other people. But some of the things we've <laughs> definitely been seeing is one, I'll start with generations. Um, but given that we're in this virtual space right now, we have a lot of stakeholders here on the campus level, whether it be our immediate students or the advisors, headquarters staff, housing core representatives, and they represent different generations. So we understand based on your seasonness. <laughs> um, how you engage with social media, how you engage with these different platforms. And so we have to bring them along and understanding how our students are having to make this shift. And so we, we have to start with our students, but parallel to that, we have to connect with our advisors and those who are connected with them. 
And so kind of giving an example with the solution, um, historically we had started having an advisor conference here um, at the University of Tennessee Knoxville. It would be a two day series where we have a mix and mingle on the first day and the second day we would have stakeholder, stakeholders from the campus engage with our advisors and housing core representatives. But understanding the zone fatigue that is happening that we see with a lot of stakeholders, we had to do things differently. And so we came together as a staff and say, how do we intentionally engage with our stakeholders um, this summer? And so we shifted to doing a Zoom um, conference, but we did it in a three-part series. And so what we traditionally would do with the two-day um, conference, we turned into three days with an hour and a half session. And that worked very well to engage with our advisors to meet them where they are. They could be at the comforts of their home or from their phone. And some of them we had to navigate when it came to QR codes. We may have to send the link and the QR code, but it was fundamentally everybody had the foundation of what a Zoom is. With our students, we already know their intention span is, is very, very, short. And so how do we engage with them? You're going to have to have the energy of Tish. When she comes in, you know she's going to bring it. I've been to a workshop where she had a full DJ, y'all. Like, it, I'm like, you got a DJ in here? It was like, I'm not even ready for it. So and you have to come with that energy. You can't go with the Charlie Brown, wah, 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 wah. You have to kind of have that energy utilizing the chat function. Find your best speakers. If you if it's not you, find that person on your team who can bring that energy to engage with people. Because our students, at the end of the day, they can buy into the experience. And for me, I don't like opera silence. I'm that person. So I'm like, hey, Brianna, I see you. Can you answer that question? And they're not expecting you to call them out. So it's the small things that make a difference. So I'll, I'll start with the dribble of generation and meeting students where they are from his intention span and thinking outside the box. So I'll throw it back to you, Josh, to get some other feedback. Awesome. Anybody else want to chime? I know a lot of people have something to say. Jared, Tish, Dr. Cole, Dr. Busamante, anybody else want to uh, address this question? I think, I think here's the thing, at the end of the day, sometimes we lean into this issue around uh, development and education and how we do that via Zoom. We gotta also remember that just like connection, how do, how do I create those social spaces? What does that look like? And whether it's students, whether it's advisors, whatever that case may be, making sure that we're creating those opportunities for just not having an official program and having the opportunity to connect and to share and to network, which are all the things that, you know, if we were able to be in person, the one-off conversations that you might have, I think about that example that T just gave with respect to the advisors conference, those one-off conversations of, at your table or walk into the meal or right. just kind of hanging out, kicking it, like you're losing those opportunities. So we have to create and be intentional about how we're creating those opportunities and creating that space, you know, to facilitate those conversations. Number one. Number two, what I would also say is this, that we got to stop apologizing. And, and what I mean by that is technology is what technology is, right? And what I see a lot of times and what I'm nervous about is this growing habit that people are apologizing because things are shifting or changing and we're navigating new space. Just call it like it is. We're navigating a newness, right? Mm -hmm. And so in navigating a newness, what that means is I simply say, we're going to do the best that we can. We're going to do the best that we can. And I'm not going to apologize if I don't get it right 100% of the time with the technology. And I'm not going to ask you to apologize because then what happens when we come back together is that we have socialized over apologizing and therefore it loses its meaning when it comes to apologizing. So really thinking about how do we create and facilitate those social opportunities and to be mindful about our language and just grant people grace with respect to the technology and understanding that that may require us to test some things. We got to get it right. People got to be patient and we're not going to get it right 100% of the time. Right. That's yeah. great. So Josh, I was thinking um, something else we really got to consider in this space that uh, is new is ensuring that we're in, we're developing intentional relationships with those that we're leading. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah. Oftentimes, a lot of our interaction, I try to uh, coin this word by saying, a lot of our interaction as leaders is situation-based, so it's situationships. So that means that, you know, uh, when it's time to discipline, you, you, your Greek life professional is considered the bad guy or the bad gal. You know, you're not considered the advocate or the ally, but it's going to take a two-part uh, in this as well. well. Now, we know we're the on-campus leadership, so that means our off-campus leadership has to also embrace policy and change. And let's be honest, yeah, you pledged in 1980. You pledged in 91, but there is no pledging now. So unfortunately, when you almost make someone feel horrible about their experience, they can't embrace it. So now that they got to make a few changes to virtualize that experience, you already made them feel like it was watered down when, uh, when it was a face-to-face -face experience. Now you're making them feel even worse. They can't help that they're going to be a file 20 initiate. And in file 20, they may have intake over Zoom. They can't help that they may be a file 20 neophyte and their programming may be virtualized. They can't help it. This is when they were born. This is when they got interested. This is when they joined. So we have to yeah. celebrate that membership is growing. Our founders' agendas are continuing to evolve into greatness. And now we're getting more elements of greatness. And for our organizations who are being very cautious of, in, in placing health over increase of membership, we need to celebrate that too. Because guess what? You, you just don't know how COVID-19 is reacting in this season. So we have to celebrate yeah. them too by saying, yeah, your membership is going to be small, but this is when we do cross-culture programming, cross-culture relationships. Guess what? Maybe Iota Phi Theta has three members and two graduated and they got one. So we're going to call them Kappas. We're going to call them Lambdas. We're going to call them Betas. And we're going to say, y'all, it's time to cross-culture program. It's time to put each other on each other backs. Be sure no charter goes extinct and be sure that mm -hmm. we carry the torch. Because guess what? I've been to campuses and I've worked with the headquarters. And to be quite honest, charter requests are still happening. So if a charter request is still happening, that means it doesn't take membership for interest to be on your campus. So that means if membership is low, interest will still prevail. We just have to work diligently in establishing intentional relationships. Shout out to T who does snack and chat. Her students know to find her eating somewhere on that campus <laughs> chatting on Facebook Live <laughs> with no invitation, no notice. My girl Tish don't mind giving a spoken word in the middle of the day on live. Vanessa been my homie from the beginning, and Suzette gonna give you the most cultured version of everything I ever heard with that fireside <laughs> cut. So I'm telling you, all of this builds authentic intentionality, and that's what we need as leaders, authentic, unplanned, sometimes just a simple text check-in. I try to check in with students, two of my clients at different schools, and maybe other professionals in my institution, because we have lacked human interaction. I just wanna show you I care. That's the first part of leadership. And that mm -hmm. will have us champion this virtual environment until we come back face to face to get that human interaction and love on each other. Uh, yes, that's, that's fantastic. If I can jump in right here. So I came prepared because I knew that was one of the questions that we were going to cover tonight in terms of, um, I want to make sure you guys can hear me, in terms of uh, suggestions for virtual programs. Here's what I want to say to the almost 120 people who are on this Zoom right now. Every advisor on here um, is not affiliated with a Greek letter organization. Every advisor on here is not advising the council that they came through. Every advisor on here is not 24. Every advisor on here is not 30. Every advisor on here is not the same cultural, racial, ethnic background as the groups that they're advising as well. So we have a plethora of professionals that are on this call. For myself um, and Josh, for example, he and I are non-campus based professionals. We're still in higher ed, but we're not on a campus per se like um, our, our recent newlywed, okay? And so we have a different perspective as it relates to what can go on um, on campus from a day-to-day -day basis, whereas we're like practitioners and guests who come in. So let me just say this, because I've got like this arsenal full of fantastic online engaging activities that a lot of these fraternity and sorority groups can engage in, but let's unpeel the onion for a second. Let's unpeel the onion for a second. The key word, the key theme that is threaded throughout this entire fabric of this conversation this evening is higher what? 
higher education. If you are a higher education professional, Tish Norman's argument is your first priority should be educating students, period. I don't care if you're a professor, I don't care if you're in student affairs, I don't care what role you play, you're on a campus, you are affiliated with an institution of higher learning. So educational opportunities should be kind of the foundation of what exchange you should want to have between you and your students. And so let me say this, let me talk to my professionals for a minute. What's your motivation? What is your motivation? What is your inspiration level? What is your, uh, wh where's your fire right now as it relates to starting this school year out with a bang, even though some may be hybrid, some may be fully remote, some may be face-to-face. -face. If you don't display conviction about the excitement you have about the virtual programming or the shift or the word that we're hearing in 2020, the pivot that's taken place from in-person to virtual, if you don't feel fire and excitement about it, your students won't. Your, your PMs, your potential members, the unaffiliated, the curious, the current members. If you're like, oh guys, so you know, we're gonna make this work, we're gonna really do the best we, no, you better have that thing coming out like fresh hot donuts at Krispy Kreme. You need to be that excited about transitioning to this virtual platform so that your students get excited about it. Don't convince your audience with a Bueller, Bueller, Bueller type of attitude. Shout out to my 80s babies, Ferris Bueller Day Off fans. The <laughs> class was sleep in that movie because the teacher lacked excitement and conviction about the information they were sharing. So how are you as the advisor, the one who gives guidance and supports and facilitates, how are you presenting this information to your students? Is it a burden? Is it a chain that you're throwing on your back? Or are you getting excited about it so that you present it in a way so that they are re ready to pick up the mantle and run with it? Change your mind rather than the glass being half empty to the glass being half full and say, hey, presidents, hey, e-board, hey, councils, we have an amazing opportunity this semester. I'm tapping in and I need you to partner with me to tap in to this creative space that we can transition our person-to-person um, -person programming, person-to-person -person recruitment into an online vehicle. So the way you present it is the way you're gonna be able to get buy-in from the people that you advise. Make sure that intent matches impact. That's a great point. That's a great point, Tish. Um, I do want to. I do want to uh, chime in as well and say something uh, really quickly. And Dr. Usamanta, you can come after me. So I have a new book coming out. Um, it should be coming out in September. It's called Red Leadership. It's not political, but it's called Retain, Engage, and Developing Culturally Diverse Leaders of the Younger Generation. And through my dissertation, there were five key components of retention. Um, uh, Dr. Cole and Jared already talked about it. One of them was a support system. As a matter of fact, support system was number one. Um, if you don't have a support system or what we do, we do a DNI space, an inclusive culture that creates a sense of belonging, there's a good chance that people are going to check out. So when we're dealing with virtual programming. The question is, have you created a virtual support system that's just as effective as an in-person support system? Which, by the way, it's going to be tougher to do it virtually. Number two, we dealt with leadership. Um, one of the styles that correlates through attention is transformational leadership is, as well as servant leadership. Tish talked about your attitude and your why. Uh, Jared talked about it's about serving students. That all correlates with leadership. And the other three factors uh, that I want to chime in as well is communication. So the way in which you communicate your, 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 your message, the way you communicate. Uh, the fourth one is as far as putting people in positions as far as where their strengths are. And one of the questions I love to ask students from different fraternity stories all the time is what is your why? Why did you join the organization in the first place? What is your why? Because the why will tell you 
ultimately what they're going to end up doing. A why is why person stays. A why is why person stays longer. As a matter of fact, in the recruitment process, I would encourage you to be telling your students to really get dig deep in what is the why. Because I'm telling you, if that why is in alignment with the mission of the organization, I promise you people will go the extra mile and people will be committed. But again, I shared that with you because I know that a lot of you are talking about retention. We're talking about recruitment and intake. And I'm going to go to you, Dr. Busamante, in regards to this, this, this question question around virtual programming, um, just around around relationship building, around leadership. Uh, what is something you think would be beneficial as far as applicable tools for those uh, that are listening right now? Thanks, Josh. So something that I would like to say, too, in terms of what you just mentioned about transformational leadership, Tish talked about this, too, is that, yes, while there are challenges with everything going on right now, there are also opportunities. And we have to take these opportunities to transform the system. So, so much has gone on in our society and in our world. And this is our opportunity as leaders, as people in, in higher education spaces, as advisors, whoever you might be, as headquarters professionals, as national professionals, whatever role you have, you have the ability to make change at this time. Uh, one thing that I would like to highlight is that while maybe you've been doing programs around Title IX that have been one hour, two hours, just talking at students, think about some of those It's On Us campaign videos that are like commercials that are on YouTube already. Maybe something that other departments on your campus can create as commercials and you play a game show and you, you ask students, you know, um, what does the Title IX office do for you, et cetera, et cetera. Integrate a poll everywhere so they can answer live, so that they can get engaged. Make it competitive so that they can win prizes. Maybe it's swag from your campus, it's swag from your organization. Make it more engaging. This is an opportunity where we don't have to do programming the way it's been done before. Uh, we just launched our game show uh, yesterday and we have another one tonight and another one tomorrow for our incoming students for orientation and this presentation has been so well received across our campus right now and it's basically integrated every single department creating a commercial a play on State Farm, a play on Nationwide, a play on different commercials, the progressive commercials, and then it's also integrating students to be able to answer questions and then we give additional information. We've included videos. It's really engaging. There are new things that you can do. You don't have to continue to do the same things. The Greek 101s, the Greek 102s, they've gotten boring. It's been repetitive information and most of those at least from how they functioned at Cal State Northridge, they were programs that were already created by Panhellenic and IFC that were then instituted to the campus to integrate everyone else. That is not inclusive if you ask me. So for those of you who oversee our historically multicultural organizations, ask them what's missing, ask them if the policies include them and make sure you're integrating those things as we're in this era of creating our change. That's a great point, that's a great point. That's what are you going to say to me? You have something to say to me? Or Tish, I think someone, I heard someone come up. All right, I'm going to move to my next question. That I, I'm, I'm ready to get to the virtual programming, I think you said, as it relates to social justice. Yeah, we'll get, yeah, 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 we're getting there. We're not there yet. But I want to move into this next question. Um, I came across a study that was actually uh, talked about in an AFA perspective article, and it was very fascinating to me. The study took place in 2018, 2019, and they literally surveyed about 25,000 members of different fraternity and sorority organizations. And in this survey, it talked about why did you join the organization? And for IFC, the number one reason they joined the organization, according to this study, was friendship. Um, according to study, the number one reason that Panhellenic uh, ladies joined the organization was because of friendship. Um, according to multicultural Greek organizations, the number one reason they joined was because of leadership development. Um, and then with our MPHC organizations, the number one reason they joined was because of philanthropy and leadership. And as well as what was very high, and I mentioned, I meant to say this as well, was career readiness. Now, when I saw that and I read that and I thought about all the Greek conferences that I've spoken to, all the experiences that I've had over the past 11 years, I sat there and a big word that my fraternity brother, Dr. Bates, said on a, on a master class, he said, we're in a season of reimagining. And I really believe with all of my heart within our fraternity store life, we're in a season of reimagining. And I think it was clear to me that a lot of the things that, that, that was in the survey that need to be met, I'm not sure. I know from what I saw has been 
it, there's been enough programming around it, but I'm gonna let you know the others talk about that. And I wanna ask the question, what can we do to be more effective as uh, advisor or as practitioners at really being the needs of our students during this time? Um, what, what, what can we do to ensure that we're, that we're, we're, we're making an impact into the very specific needs of our students? And uh, I'll start with you, Jared. What do you, what do you want to say? What, what do you think we need to do in order to begin to make an impact? I mean, workforce readiness is huge to me. That's why um, I took this opportunity to serve as a cyber uh, security apprenticeship director. Apprenticeship was just an unknown space in higher education. Micro-credentials was an unknown space. So, you know, as uh, especially during Hazen Prevention Month, um, a lot of times when I'm when I'm vulnerable and students are vulnerable with me, they almost say, well, what can I do in a frustrated tone? And I'm like, let me give you some examples. You can be sure every one of those interests have a LinkedIn account. You can ensure that each one of them have a, a resume and, and, and not a resume because um, because you just want to check a block, but a resume that quantifies and qualifies their skills. So when they're a member, they're a member who can be gainfully employed upon graduation. You can, you can give, have conversations about excessive student loan debt, you know, ensuring that you ain't taking all that refund and running to Miami to come hang out with us for spring break. <laughs> you can have those conversations. And guess what? If they don't get it right the first time, go do that resume again. You know, yeah. matter of fact, let me do this. I'm going to give it to my alumni chapter president. You said you want to be in, in, in the psychology field. I'm going to look for somebody in that field in our alumni chapter. I'm going to take that resume. I'm going to take that binder, that intake line. I'm going to give it to my alumni chapter. Now, guess what? That chapter has a new level of respect for how you view intake and how you review membership coming in. And it's a twofold benefit. Now they're getting workforce ready. So those that desire career entry, I'm a huge advocate. When you walk off the other end of that stage, you should be walking and getting dapped up with a business card saying, hey, man, I can't wait to interview you. You know, I saw something in you, something we said in our pre-meeting before this happened. I said, regardless, once you join, if you didn't want to be a role model or a leader on campus, once you put on these letters, guess what you are? A leader. And, yep. and, and when I was in a Sigma, I was looking out the blinds, watching YouTube, figuring out how to Sigma walk because I wanted to be a Sigma because I saw Sigmas. <laughs> So guess what? Somebody wants to be a member of your org just off of what they see in you. So add to the toolkit that you also want to be a graduate who walks smooth into their career or a student that walks smooth into a grad program that's being paid for because you marketed yourself as, 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 as a value added to a program. I love it. Tania, I think you asked. I think I saw you leaning down. There we go. You got my hands running, my hands running. Uh, one, of my, one of my strengths is connecting this. And so I'm gonna pick up where my brother just left off. Um, Dr. Eric Simeon did a research similar to what you did, and it talks about this valued added experience, particularly around the lens of this generation Z. We cannot no longer promote this brotherhood and sisterhood because that's the we are the world mentality. They want this valued added experience of what are these transferable skills that I'm going to get that's going to elevate my opportunity to be um, successful once I graduate. And some of his research was showing particularly with our culture-based students are more inclined to come back to their campuses and give back to the community because they were engaged in these philanthropic endeavors and engaged in these community service opportunities. So that's kind of picking up what my brother Jerry talked about. But one seat that was recently dropped on me, I went to a supervisor summit and the um, leadership theory was VUCU. I thought the man was making up I'm like VUCU, like what VUCU who? And I had never heard of it, but I was like vitality, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And ambiguity. And in short, it's just saying things are just crazy out here, right? And that's where we are with this pandemic. And how we help our students navigate that is going to the Buku Prom world. And that's looking at vision. How are we as student affairs professionals providing vision for our students? Um, Tish, and I think Vanessa kind of spoke to, we have to have that motivation and finding that why and how we get our students beyond getting just unstuck. And and then we have to provide understanding of, we have to understand where they are. This is the first time some of our students are dealing with racial disparities, dealing with the loss of family members. And it's hard for them they're, and they get, they're getting stuck in the why is, woe is me. But we have to make that alignment. It's like, this is what your founders navigated. So this is when you talk about the true work, this is where they kind of galvanize 
and came together. One thing, you know, Tish was, you know, stood up and proud and had, had the 2020 in pink and green. But one thing I've seen in our D9 organizations across the board, this is having us come together as a collective community. And so how are we able to navigate those worlds is creating understanding, understanding and then clarity about those models and then agility. Because this is not meant for the weak. You have to put your, put, put your boots on, lace them up, and let's re get ready to put in some work. And so how we navigate that are a lot of different layer, layers of creating that VUCU state, but also providing that platform for them to succeed in what they do. See, let me, let me say this, um, and this is for those culturally based organizations. If I can just keep it 100, can I, can I just keep it 100? Let's go. Like, because it's real, Come on. It's, it's real easy to talk about, you know, your D9 experience or your undergrad collegiate Greek experience, and it's romanticized, right? It's I real agree. easy to do that. But I'm going to speak from, like, my real experience. And I'm going to tell you, don't think, and I'll even reference in, for example, that movie Stomp the Yard, where the guys were recruiting and talking to you know, the young kid, Columbus Short, and they were like, we got the strongest brotherhood out there. You join our organization, the brother sees your resume, he knows to hook you up. Uh, that don't always happen. That's what I'm trying to say. Don't expect with false uh, uh, expectations that just because you're a member of an organization that somebody is going to put you on. That oh. does not always happen. And I agree with you. I think the point of is, I think Jerry talked about it a little bit. Our students prepare their members for the presentation show, or they prepare them once a little bit of bid, but they don't teach them beyond that experience. And I tell my students, you can either train somebody or you can educate somebody. You can train them to spit out information, ABC, one, two, three, alpha, beta, whatever, but they're only good for that moment of the show. But beyond that show is where our business shows up. Do you know who your campus-based professional is? Do you know how to turn in that event request form? Do you know how to connect with your headquarters? Half of them, I have people like, I got my brain, but you can't identify the only MPHC organization I find in an MPHC organization, um, uh, HBCU. I'm like, first of all, why you got a brain? Let, let's have a conversation about that. But there are people who get stuck in that moment between trained and educated. And so one thing I started navigating with my new member organizations, new member trainings, is how do you teach beyond that process? In my sorority, we have an embellishment process. And so how are we educating that person for the chapter management beyond just that initial new member um, process? And those are the skills that are that are falling under that career readiness umbrella those are the skills that are transferable into your life's work into your life's pursuit so that when you are knowledgeable at building relationships and you know your mphc reps and you're communicating and connected with uh professionals on your campus who you know have been there as seasoned professionals for years and years and years when you hold a leadership position in your organization when you're managing money when you're holding all of these different um, responsible roles that give you this experience, those are some of the tools that you can use, utilize then in that next stage of your life, be it classroom, corporate, or whatever. And so career readiness, that can be a little bit vague. So some of those tenants that can fall under there are, well, let's funnel it a little bit and see what those skills are that are uh, uh, easily transferable that I learned in undergrad that I can use into uh, my professional world. I think, Dr. I, think, Cole. I think the other thing, thanks Josh, I, I think the other thing that I would throw out there though is what is, well, I want to go back to something that Jay said, what does relationship look like right now? You know, the, the study that you shared, Josh, talking about the value of friendship and how individuals are prioritizing that, do we know how to check in on one another? You know, come on, come are, on. Are we, yeah. are we, yeah, are we well aligned to do that in this virtual space? If we host a virtual meeting and folks don't show up, do we reach back out to them and say, hey, what's going on? How are you doing? How's life happening for you? We don't know how people are acclimated at home or wherever they're residing at present. You know, the beauty of the college and university experience for many marginalized and minoritized populations is that I get to be my authentic self. 
And if I'm at home, I may not actually be able to live out all the identities that I have come to own. And the sisterhood and brotherhood and the sorority and the fraternity are supposed to be there for me. And are we checking in on folks? Are we reaching out? Are we picking up the phone? Are we FaceTiming? Are we sending a video uplift message? Are we utilizing all the different platforms that exist of, you know, I, I don't care whether it's Zoom or even Marco Polo, right? Like, I'm just going to send you a video chat just so that you get something that's not a static message that you got to read, tone in, but you get to see my face and you get to see my excitement. You have some folks who are going through it. And it's testing mm -hmm. the value of relationship right now. If you haven't actually gone out of your way to check in on your people, then did you really have a friendship? You know, I, I've had the opportunity to um, speak with a number of our Black, Indigenous, people of color who are members of Panhellenic and IFC organizations in particular over the course of the last month or so. And overwhelmingly, one of the critiques that they are offering is that those in leadership who do not look like them, represent those identities, do not know how to reach out to them and say, hey, I just want to see if you're okay. And so for my white folks who are in leadership in those organizations, I want to speak real directly. We have got to be better at helping the humans reach out to their humans. And as student affairs professionals, we got to be able to provide some guidance around that. Folks' mental health is taking a strain. Folks' ability to, to participate in things is taking a strain. We're seeing how Maslow's hierarchy of needs is playing out in, in very real ways in terms of, do I feel safe where I live? Can I then engage in relationships? And so from a relationship standpoint, hosting a, a Netflix watch party is cool, but if you're just inviting me to events and you're not checking in on me as a person, then do we really have a relationship? And if you're not checking in on me as a person, why would I come to a program? If you're not checking in on me as a person, how or why would I feel like you want to be there for me? And so this sisterhood and brotherhood that you had me commit to you're not fulfilling your obligation to me. Why should I fulfill my obligation to you? And so that apathy is setting in. You show me an apathy pro problem, I'll show you an inclusion problem. Because our, our folks don't know how to engage in inclusivity in this space and in this place right now to be able to show up for one another. And, and that's got to be something that we have some very transparent, truthful, unfiltered conversations around. That's, that's, I think that's such a, such a phenomenal point. Um, you know, me and Jared, we're fraternity brothers. We live seven minutes away from each other and never seen each other in person. Uh, but we met people digitally. We met each other digitally. We got to build relationships digitally. And I think that's a skill set, right? To learn how do you network? How do you build relationships digitally? How do you connect with people? Um, I think that's a skill set, especially when you're going through. Because, you know, when you're going through, you ain't sure. Some of y'all don't want to talk to no one. Don't call me. Don't talk to me. I want to be in my silo. Uh, you know, just if we be 100, some of y'all live with y'all family. Like, I'm so stressed out right now. I just want to get away by myself and be somewhere just to get rid of all the stress that's going on. And so I think that's so powerful. But one thing that I appreciate about my, my brother, brother Jared, man, is he'll just send me text out of nowhere, man. It's going to be all right, brother. I'm praying for you, man. It's, I mean, he'll just send me stuff and just brighten up my day. You know what I'm saying? And I think that stuff goes a really long ways. And, and again, um, in, in Titch's point, you're right. There are some, there are some shady folks. <laughs> there are some shady folks that's supposed to be your brother and some shady folks that's supposed to be your sister, but y'all know I'm faith-based. So I go back to that Bible. I believe you love no matter what. So what you do to me does not determine how I'm going to treat you. Again, if they don't live up to the values, that doesn't mean you don't live up to the value. So if they ain't having brotherhood or sister, that don't mean you don't do the same. And so I think it's taking that personal responsibility and living up to the commitments that you said that you were going to do. Um, we're almost we're already an hour through this so i gotta i gotta move into this other question uh before we get there 
If you have any questions that you want to answer, um, any uh, Q&A, you can put that in the chat as well. I uh, want to make you aware of a couple other things that I want to make you aware of as well. Um, uh, oh, oh, next. Oh, 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 my points ain't there. OK, OK. I want to make you aware of another thing um, for those of you that may, uh, again, want to just promote the Circle of Change Leadership Conference. Again, this is our, like commercial break. For those of you who did not weren't here in the beginning or interested in possibly sending your students to a Transformation Leadership Conference, watch this, that specializes in career Readiness. Let me say it again. Career readiness. Let me say it again. Career readiness with panelists that are from fraternity and sorority organizations. One of our career fests, uh, Pete Parker, he's on here right now. He is very embedded within the Greek community as well. He has an incredible program as well uh, called Greek Ladder. So again, uh, we're hitting that. Uh, number two, if you want to bring any of these wonderful people to your campus as speakers, uh, as consultants, uh, that information will come up there as well. Reach out to them. Um, they have some incredible message. Again, when you're dealing with the panel, uh, it kind of is a disservice to everything that everyone can bring forth, but they're incredible if you cannot tell, uh, so you can reach out to them. Um, and the last thing I do want to get into um, is I want to get into, I saw a question, Mike, I guess the question left me. I was going to answer the question, but it's okay because I want to get this question anyways. Uh, Dr. Busamante, I'm getting, we'll answer that question after this. Uh, Dr. Bus, oh, is there a link for me to share this recorded conference? Oh, it left. I think it'll be beneficial if I could share with people from my organization. Yes, um, there will. So if you register for this particular virtual masterclass, there will be a link that we put together. This is being recorded and um, you'll get an email for that. Um, sometimes when I send it through my ways of sending out emails, because I have so many contacts, uh, if you want to make sure you get it, send me a personal email and we'll definitely get this recording to you when it's available. But I got, I got to move here because we're already an hour in and I think this is a really important conversation we got to move into. Dr. Busamante, I'm starting with you. I want to deal with anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And how do we integrate this within the Greek community? Um, there's so many things to say. This will probably take us to the end, but it's important. Dr. Busamante, it's in your hands. Thank you, Josh. Um, you definitely know this is my topic. <laughs> I've been invited uh, to speak on this in various fraternity and sorority life circles, especially because I've been speaking about this loud uh, for a very long time over the last five years. Um, and I think where we need to start with these conversations is to be very honest with bringing our historically multicultural groups to the table to ask them how they're feeling, to ask them how the fraternity and sorority life system has con completely disregarded them over the last hundred years, um, to be honest, because it started a long, long time ago and people have not started having these conversations. Um, a couple of years ago, I won the AFLV West Fraternity and Sorority Life Professional of the Year Award, but my programs were not accepted to AFLV West. Wow. Um, my programs were talking about um, historically white fraternities and sororities, the racism, the um, the, do the donors, and basically everything, the elitism of fraternity and sorority life. Um, so for me, um, this has been a long overdue conversation, um, definitely rubbed a lot of professionals in the wrong way um, over the years, and I have not shut up about it. I'm not going to shut up about it. I think You're now- right, <laughs> I think now that everything's come up, now people are like, oh, Vanessa was saying this a while ago. Let's have her come and talk to us about it. Um, so I think it's very interesting, but I think honestly, um, the system itself is messed up um, and it needs to be corrected at the campus level. Uh, there were many conversations that I had as a professional where they were constantly not holding IFC and PHC organizations accountable because they were scared of donors coming to the college and asking questions. So those are conversations that need to be had and to be honest, advisors need to lead those conversations on the college campus. Um, too much, too many times, we ask that our students hold the torch and that our students initiate those conversations. My students called um, for uh, a basically a looking at of fraternity and sorority life. They followed something that um, the University of Washington, I believe, instituted at their college. They, um, they were given an allotment for money, um, for historically multicultural fraternities and sororities at the University of Washington and at Cal State Northridge, they were basically told like, no, this is not happening. This is not real. Um, so it was just really interesting how it had happened at another university and at Cal State Northridge where you had 
more historically multicultural fraternities and sororities and affinity based groups than you had Panhellenic and IFC, they were still being disregarded. So I think this is still um, something that we need to initiate and we, while we do need allies, we don't need performative allies and black and brown people can speak their truth and they should be asked to start to have these conversations, of course, if they if they feel that they have the ability to and that they want to, they shouldn't be required to. But there are people like myself who, who speak on these things who will come to your campus and initiate these conversations and keep it raw and authentic. Um, because I really think that this is something that needs to be corrected. I think also our students have felt for many years this disassociation from fraternity and sorority life. Um, because of the fact that policies, procedures, words do not include them in at, at the college level. They're constantly being told to conform. Like I mentioned, we started a Greek 101 and a Greek 102, and our students were asked to conform to these settings that, you know, they didn't understand the language from. They didn't understand what was going on in these, in these programs or workshops, but because the college needed to do something, they followed a Panhellenic and IFC model. And that is not okay. I think um, our students are able to initiate and have these conversations. My students were able to at the time and they were still being disregarded. So I think um, that is honestly what needs to start happening. These conversations need to start have happening authentically and basically ba real, like keeping it real, like Tish said, like you gotta keep it real when you have these conversations. Um, and I know it's hard as a professional. As a professional, I sat in those spaces and I constantly thought about, am I gonna lose my job today? Um, but there has to come a point where you realize that the impact that you're making is more important than potentially losing that job. And for me, it outweighed losing that job. And that's why I was so outspoken. Um, so I definitely think that we need to start having these conversations. It doesn't need to be about programming. It doesn't need to be about um, thinking about what we need to do around diversity, equity, inclusion. Those are just buzz buzzwords. And they're just basically integrating students in to a system that is not set up for them. And so to really set up a system for them, you need to start from the foundation. Yeah, Vanessa, don't, never, never, never quiet your voice. I'll, I'll always use your voice and that's right. Let, let, me, let me say something. It's time for us to breed Newsome, everybody, in the virtual world and, and in person. It's time for us to breed Newsome, everybody. Who is Bree Newsome? That's the sister that climbed up on the flagpole to remove the Confederate flag and did not ask for permission. So it is time for these conversations to take place. I'm not yelling at y'all. I'm just speaking with power, conviction, and authority. I want to say two things, and then I'm going to pass it on to the next panelist. Don't assume that just because these are black and brown and or culturally based fraternity and sorority organizations that they know their history. Don't assume it. Don't assume just because you're black, you know black history. I want you to assume the polar opposite, because if you look at the students now who are undergrads, shout out to my young people. If you look at the students now, they're 18 to you know, 21, 22. Even if they're affiliated, of course, um, who, who are their quote unquote profites? Who are their bigs? Who are their, you know, they're, they're 22, they're 21, so they didn't know it either. So my point is this, it's time to Sankofa the black fraternal movement. It's time to Sankofa, the Black Fraternal Movement. What is Sankofa? Sankofa is an Ankan word generating from uh, West Africa that means go back and get it. That means the bird is facing forward, but his head is turning around to get the egg. That means simply you don't know where you're going unless you know where you've been. And so what we're finding out is a lot of these affiliated members are black and gold, are purple and gold, they bleed crimson and cream, they bleed pink and green, and don't really know jack about their organizations on a real meaningful, deep level. If we want to Sankofa the Black Fraternal Movement, that means we need to dig in and extract elements of historical references that our founders used and implemented and created when they established these, under or, these organizations under immeasurable odds. Today, we have information at our fingertips. Today, we have resources 
over and beyond what we will even use in a lifetime. And from word of mouth, through meetings, through conversation, through gatherings of people in spaces, were these people able to organize, for women able to organize in a maternally, paternally driven co a collegiate environment, were they able to forge organizations where women can support one another so that they can bond through academic and social gatherings so they can be there for one another. So number one, it's time to send COFA the Black Fraternal Movement. You must talk about and you must reach back and you must be aware and you must acknowledge the sacrifice of people who did much with little and use some of that now where we have so much now where we can go over and beyond and really be the change agents that our camp, that our organizations need to see. Second and final point, for our allies, for the white and majority or multicultural and majority organizations, basically I'm speaking about Panhellenic and IFC. I did a training uh, two Mondays ago for the University of Kentucky's Panhellenic new recruiters, about 1,400 new recruiters who were, virtual, who were going through virtual recruitment this year on unconscious bias. As I did my research, as we always do, right? I went to their, all their socials, I went to their website, I went to the uh, university's website. Let me tell you what UK's Panhellenic, that is uh, 3,500 white women in South, in South Kentucky, in the Southern state of Kentucky, had on their Instagram. Shout out to the Wildcats of UK right now. They had multiple resources on their Instagram that showed their solidarity and support, not just for Black Lives Matter. The Black Lives Matter, I get it. That's the current civil rights movement. That's the current uh, Black power movement. I get it. But they had uh, expressed uh, infographics, expressed written letters, pictures, all kinds of support that spoke out in support of a movement that supports the humanity of all people. They had a list of black owned businesses in Lexington, Louisville, Maysville, Covington, all major cities in the state of Kentucky where you can go and support and eat at black owned businesses. They had or, uh, stores, boutiques, all kinds of black owned businesses that they promoted to support these kinds of efforts, not to mention just graphics and speaking out and saying, we, this particular organization stands in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. Shout out to um, uh, Panhellenic for putting up signs uh, for Breonna Taylor, who did attend University of Kentucky, who said, we stand in solidarity to get the cops arrested uh, for, you know, murdering Breonna Taylor in her bed, basically. So they spoke out against it and they were unapologetic in their support in these social justice movements. So what can black folks do? What can black and brown folks do? Sankofa your organization, Sankofa your, um, 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 your council. What can allies do in the majority of larger organizations? Stand out speak out, do your research, be unapologetic in your support. And remember, support for one social justice or multiple social justice efforts and movements does not mean that diminishes your station as a powerhouse and as a, a reputable force on your campus. Dropping the pen. Share it. Oh, Dr. Cole, I was gonna go to Jared, but yeah, whoever wants to go first, uh, take it away, Dr. Cole. Okay. So here's the thing, I appreciate what, what my sister Tish said. I'm gonna, though, put a pin in something. And the pin that I'm gonna put in it is, I don't, as a white human, get to label myself an ally. I don't get to do that. I'm an advocate. I wanna advocate for the well-being, for the rights. I wanna advocate for amplifying the voices of the marginalized and the oppressed. I don't want to speak for people. I want to create spaces where they can speak for themselves. I want to amplify their voices, crediting those who originated the words. So I don't get to label myself an ally. 
I get to label myself an advocate. It's only when those who I stand in solidarity with start to see me as an ally and label me as an ally within their respective community. So that's first and foremost. Two, within that, I don't get to advocate in one room and make ignorant statements in another, which means that I have to make sure that I'm doing the self-work. Self-work is more than just reading a book or listening to a podcast. It means that I have to make sure that I'm learning about the identities that stretch me. It means that maybe I think about the intersectionality of identities so that I understand that anti-racism is one part of diversity, equity, and inclusion and an essential part of diversity, equity, and inclusion, but I cannot make sure that I'm showing up in an anti-racist way if I'm not also championing the rights of the undocumented, if I'm not also championing the rights of those who uh, identify within the LGBTQIA community. It means that I have to make sure that I am learning how to be inclusive, not just with my language and making statements, but also in my actions, because that is the measure of our character. A lot of folks putting out statements. I appreciate a good statement. But I, you show me a statement and I'm going to look for your actions. You show me a picture and I'm going to look behind the scenes. Are you tokenizing humans for your own gain? Are you promoting now as a Panhellenic and an IFC those humans who you have in your membership who come from marginalized and minoritized identity groups for the sake of saying, look at us, we can't be that way. How are you showing up for them every day? That becomes important. It also becomes important that you're challenging the history of your own organization, that you are having a reckoning and a restorative justice moment to own the exclusionary discriminatory pasts that exist within your own organization or on your own campus. It means that you're doing that work and you're taking that stand because that's what it means to make sure that you're advocating for change across the board. I appreciate the young humans who are resigning their membership because they believe that their organizations have not done the work that they need to do. As someone who has considered resigning her own membership, not once, not twice, not three times, but four times as an alumni member of my organization, I recognize that that is easy. It is easy to resign the membership. It is hard to stay in the room and continue to champion the voice. And as a majoritized human who has privilege in lots of different ways, not just based on my race, it is my job to stay in the room and continue that advocacy, no matter how hard it gets, because that's the way that we make change. I appreciate an implicit bias workshop, but what are we doing on the day-to-day -to, -day to police our own implicit biases? How are we unlearning the encoding that's been imprinted on my brain for 18 plus years? That doesn't change overnight. It's the consistent interaction and challenge that we need. And so I, I just wanna make sure that we are hearing that and understanding that, that there's a reckoning that needs to happen in order for a healing that needs to take place to really embrace the diversity, equity, and inclusion that is necessary at present. I want to, um, I, I, I know, Jared, I see you today coming up, so I'm going to let y'all go, but I, I just, I, it's burning in me right now. Because uh, I do, I think, I don't, I think we've glossed over what Dr. Busamante said, and I want to go back to that. You were, you were, you were voted advisor of the year and not one of your programs got accepted. I want to say this again. You were advisor of the year and none of your programs got accepted. Now I say that because I believe from my lens, 
That is so real because one of the things I don't even want to talk about diversity. Um, I'm out of diversity because first of all, if you don't create the right inclusive environment, diversity doesn't matter. So, so if we're not, if we're not dealing with systematic racism, um, if we're not dealing with elitism, but, but let me go a step farther. If we're not dealing with the equity question, because the equity is the big thing for me, the equity question is the big thing for me because my whole notion is, are we providing everyone with equal access and opportunity or are we playing the clickest game and are we only accepting those who we like or those who are in our circle? Now, again, if it one of my one of my one of my, my church friends always said to me, it always starts from the head up. And so if the head is matriculating the behavior, then it's going to hit everything else. And, and again, I know it's not popular, but Dr. Musamante, you've inspired me to say it because I've been holding on to this for a long time. And it's just it's unfortunate that a lot of our programming, and a lot of things that we do, there's a lot of um, lack of equal access. That's the word I want to use. And so when we do that, not only are we holding back people from learning what Dr. Musamante had to say, but more importantly, we're. We're, we're, we're really falling into this trap of nepotism versus actually creating a place where we bring people to the table. And that's what really needs to be dealt with. Are we bringing people to the table? Are we giving equal access? And here comes the big one. Tania, you're going to agree with me. Are we paying our multicultural speakers the same dollar as we're paying those from the majority group? Now, these are some real questions we have to ask ourselves. And again, I know this ain't popular talk that I'm saying, but again, if we're going to talk about diversity, inclusion, and equity, it ain't enough just to go out there and say social media. To be honest with you, unconscious bias isn't enough. That will One, one unconscious bias train ain't doing nothing. That's a waste of time because in order to even change biases, that takes a long process. But if we really want to make change, these are some real things we have to address. And here's the question. Are we willing to have the tough conversations? If we do not address that issue, everything else doesn't matter. I mean, it, it's amazing to me. I see people that advocate. We believe in inclusion. We believe in equity. And behind closed doors, they're doing the very opposite because, watch this, not because of them, but because as leaders that have a responsibility on our campuses, to model diversity, equity, and inclusion, we allow that stuff to go on and we don't speak up. Therefore, it's a recycling process. It's a recycling process until someone sounds the alarm. So Dr. Busamante, I'm glad you spoke up because I've think i been wanting to say it for about five or seven years, but you just got me going. So I'm glad you spoke up. Tania, you got something to say. Jared, I don't know where you at, brother, but I need you to come out here too. But go on, Tania. I, I just had to say it was boiling in me. The time go ahead, Tania. is now. The time is now. Um, as Vanessa mentioned, when we talk about systemic barriers in sorority and fraternity life, let's talk about naming, first of all. We are not Greeks. We are in Greek-lettered organizations. So I've had a colleague tell me when she first came to campus, she was looking for the Greeks because that was her culture. And she saw all these Greek letters. She's like, this is not what I celebrate. And so we have to start with this, the naming. We are sororities and fraternities that are in Greek lettered organizations. We have to start with our staff and our teams that we work with. To Vanessa's point, we have systemic issues that go on for hundreds of years. By no, I loosely say by no fault of their own, when fraternal organizations were started, they were for white males. So females were separated from that, but then our white females came into that. Then you have culture-based groups, then you have sexual identity, you have military, you have all the intersections of identities, but the systemic part, we have not addressed. Even in our professional groups, we get offended when we say historically white organizations, that's what you are, right? We're historically black organizations. And so we have to start with that naming piece, but then we have these diversity and equity inclusion positions that some of our panel and IFC groups are creating. But then the people who hire for those positions email us saying, hey, I got hired for this position. Can you give me some resources? I I'm confused. You just got hired for a job, but you're asking me for resources. So don't just put somebody who's not competent in a position to do that. And so we have to, that first part I want to address is we truly have to do the work. As Suzette mentioned, it's the ugly area where sometimes we have to say, ouch to one another. And like, if you're the only at your job, sometimes we walk into spaces where nobody's speaking about the issues that are happening with, you know, racial disparities of somebody just getting brut uh, brutally murdered. And you walk, this man was jogging 
But then you walk into your office, I've had colleagues say, nobody asked me nothing. And we're supposed to just show up like, oh, everything's fine. I've had students have to protest on campus and getting death threats and calling me saying, hey, Miss Tanio, this is what's going on. This was a couple of years back. And then I had the same day, next uh, colleague saying, what happened? As a, a professional of color, I don't have that luxury just to not know and not show up. So we need our other white colleagues to stand up and not only just creating space, but speaking up in that space. Right now, that racial fatigue and that burnout, I don't have the energy to give all the time. And so don't come to me with the tears like, oh, I'm just, I'm here for you. One um, person, I love you. Woman, who are you? I don't even know you. You talking about you love me. You want to give me all these tears. I need action. Like Susan said, don't just put on the, the, good, the good badge because it looks good if you're not willing to do the work. But then the other half I'm going to talk about on the student level is we have to talk about community. Community is also another buzzword. Um, I've created an opportunity called Cross Council Exchange. And through that, I bring all four councils together in this, this relatively small group, about 100 to about 120 students from different councils, different chapters. And we have intentional um, conversations around cross-cultural competencies, cultural humility, biases, and it breaks down those barriers. Because originally, when I started this a couple of years back before I got to this institution, I did kind of assessment. And one of the activities I do, and primarily with Penelick and IFC, raise your hand if you knew at that particular campus four um, councils existed, vast majority nothing. So now fast forward, like um, I think it was um, Tish that mentioned, we're not any spring chickens. The average person is filled out three to four years, 27. I'm a little bit past that. And so when you're looking about for our seasoned folks who are in these positions, they had that same experience. And so they implemented these systems that uh, sis Vanessa talked about that they know from Panhellenic and IFC and want to put a, a puzzle piece that's not fitting for all. So we have to talk about that equity piece. And so when we talk about community, we have to be able to unpack that. And sometimes we're uncomfortable, but our students are ready. So when I'm doing a Assessments, our students are saying, we want to go a little deeper. We want to go a little deeper. And so myself and a couple of my colleagues, we got together and we kind of facilitate some opportunities called leaning in. And we looked at power dynamics. And so one of the panelic ladies, um, she thought when we were asking about places of privilege, people thought we're going to be looking at uh, white privilege. And privilege is so much more than that piece of it. And so when we, uh, it was a simple little assessment we found and we kind of uh, gave that um, survey assessment and it was asking do you still have both of your parents and when we began to unpack it she said I would have never thought that a place of privilege um, of me having my parents versus somebody who does not so do I now need to speak up for those sisters in my panel and sorority when we have a father's day event what about those women who don't have one and so that awareness ha ha I have a place of privilege where I need to advocate for somebody else because oftentimes when we talk about privilege a lot of people want to associate white right. privilege right right well, not privilege. I, I wear glasses me and Tish put on glasses right now and so I don't have that privilege just to have that 2020 so we have to be able to unpack that works so the two similar to what my sister um, Tish mentioned two things do the work and do it for the professionals because you can't do the work that you want our students to have if you're not doing the work yourself yeah. and then two what our students we although we work in our different councils we have to have those competency skills to bring collective community together community should not just be a buzzword that you come together with diversity and community we have it no community requires action and if you're not willing to put in the work for that action then what are you doing in this field because they're going to have a one-sided perspective if we're not training our GAs to be culturally competent with all four councils if we're not culturally competent uh, and, and knowledge of not saying you need to work with them probably but knowledge of for councils and be able to foster community what are we doing because if anything this pandemic has given us time and yeah. the question yeah. is Jared. what are we doing oh. with that time Jer, we ain't heard from the brother, man. I'm trying to find out. Jer, where you at, man? <laughs> the beneficial is we have traditional programs, signature programs that may have been popping 10 years ago. They may have been popping 15 years ago, but they're not popping right now. And they're not popping based off the environment and the need for our orgs to step up and lead or even students to lead. So what I say is don't let the chapterisms and traditions of your chapter keep you doing stale programming that just ain't reaching the campus. What I always tell folks is examine the reach. Um, when we were, I'm from the country, so when you used to be about to fight, even if you knew you was going to lose, first thing you say is you ain't got enough reach to fight me. You really was hoping somebody was going to break it up for it started, to be honest. 
But what that really means is if I extend my fist out, my arm out, my fist gonna hit your jaw for yours hit my jaw. And guess what? You don't have enough reach. So you need to understand that some of your chapterisms and traditions and old stale signature programs don't have enough reach to really touch the community needs. So you need to assess the community needs. And these assessments don't really need surveys right now. You can actually know right now our national climate is a reflection of our campus climate. You know what I'm saying? So just because social action may look like to your signature program to pick up paper around the resident halls or pick up paper on the street, that necessarily won't be a popping program right now. That paper gonna have to sit still on that street <laughs> and we're gonna have to address voting suppression and ensure everybody in our resident hall is registered, registered to vote. Yeah. You know, cause that's gonna be a signature program that's relevant for right now. So I, I, I challenge you to examine your reach. Be sure you can hit the jaw of your community with effective change so that you're not sitting that arm out and guess what? Doing the same old dry stuff, but yet still making it to Conclave, making it to Boule and getting all the awards. You're coming back with trophies, but I always tell folks, when you look in the mirror, you can be a little old cat. You're gonna see a lion if you got a bunch of trophies, but what does your community see when they see your organization? So you have to ensure that your reach is reaching the community. And if we can do that, I believe we will not look like RSOs on campus. We'll look like change agents on campus. And oh, I'm in the business good. of being in a change agent org for notability versus being in an RSO that just so happened to be popping and lit for the right now. Jared, did you just say uh, business? <laughs> <laughs> That's when you know it was real. It was serious. It was super serious. It's business. He was for real about that one. Business. I, I felt that one. Real, real quick, we only literally have about three minutes left. Um, it went that fast. Uh, very powerful statements. Um, I'm, I'll start with you, Tish. I'm going to go all the way across the board. Uh, final thoughts. So, Tish, I'm going to give you a final thought. We have three minutes left. Um, so, we'll start with you, Tish. It's on you. Final thoughts. Um, be creative. Creativity was my line name. Be creative when it comes to advising. Be creative when it comes to social social justice, uh, virtual programming. Be creative when it comes to programming. Um, host a, um, uh, a, 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 a an online virtual um, speech um, improv. Go have your students dig in the vaults of some famous speeches giving and have them recite it and then have a discussion following. Do a TED Talk marathon. Get some social justice TED Talks and, and challenge everybody to find one and post one that's three minutes or a snippet of it and then have a discussion around it. Be creative when it comes to um, your social justice programming. Do what the ancestor said, get in good trouble, get in necessary trouble, uh, make sure your voice is heard as it relates to social justice movements. Make sure you vote 2020 and make sure we arrest the cops that killed Breonna Taylor. Find me on LinkedIn. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tess. That was awesome. Dr. Busamante. So my last thing is I always focus from a frame of equity. And so right now I'm talking to advisors or people who are affiliated with historically multicultural fraternities and sororities. For any leaders out there, know that your time for your organizations is now, that you should be educating your students or your members um, across the nation on the foundations of these organizations, why they started and why they're so important. And for our advisors at different colleges and universities, it is also your time to start allowing your students to be free, to allow them to do their calls during meetings when their organizations are being called out, to allow them to be proud and showcase their strolls, their salutes, whatever they do. Do. Um, I noticed that with students, most of the time they've been, they felt like they couldn't do those things because it wasn't allowed or it wasn't part of the culture. It is part of our culture. And so you should start honoring that in your meetings or in your settings, whatever you're doing. Um, and other than that, I just want to say it's, it's our time to re claim it's our time to look at things and dismantle them and redo them and do them the way that is best for our students especially our black and brown indigenous students awesome i love it i love the question that was awesome dr Rusnana. thank you so much uh jared so i think about um i know after this conference after this panel um a lot of us want to go make a, a leap of change 
I think be sure you uh, you look at your change uh, steps and you look at it in steps because every step is going to matter when you're planning out how you can implement uh, your, your students to become change agents. Uh, when I used to carry the groceries up for my mom, we lived on the third floor. And every, every time I would try to carry them, you know, when you're carrying groceries, you're going to get a mile. You ain't doing one bag at a time. <laughs> That's not happening. So circulation about to be cut off holding all them plastic bags. I would try to skip steps and my clumsy self would fall. But what I learned is every step had value getting to that third floor. And each step taught me something. So what I need you to know is don't skip steps trying to rush change agents. No, no, no. Every step has a point. Every step you examine privilege on step one. Maybe step two is, it, is teaching across the cultures. Maybe step three is coming up with a meaningful program. Maybe step four is recruiting in this virtual space by keeping smaller orgs relevant. But don't skip all them steps and say, now you have graduated from uh, ineffectiveness to change agent status. It don't happen that fast, but guess what? You got six folks, six folks on here that are willing to be your allies to ensure you can hit each step and each milestone so that you, you're developing change agents on campus. And, uh, and we, we're here to support you. Follow me on LinkedIn, connect with me. Uh, I'm at www.leadfirmspeaks.com. I'm excited to partner with you. But more than anything, I'm excited to continue the work of fraternity and sorority life and developing leaders for the now in the pandemic post the pandemic, in the struggle, after the struggle, during this national crisis of, of, of racism and, 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 and killing our people to post it happening because it's going to end because we're going to be the leaders to ensure it ends. Awesome. I love it. Powerful points. Tania. All right. So we should have creative, the time is now, and every step has value. I'm going to say intentional. Be intentional about what you do and how you show up. Don't show up because it looks good and the optics sound good. Don't say words. Oh, I know they had a kickback and it, you just you heard somebody just say that and have no understanding of what it. Be intentional on how you show up and, and when you show up, show up 110%. When we show when we make the commitment to do the work of sorting fraternity life, we make that commitment to uplift our students. I think uh, Trish talked about, look, we have to elevate our students. Find out your why. Because sometimes we get burned out of this. And if it's time, if you've been burnout maybe it's a time for shifting but sometimes it's a time to reassess where you are so be intentional about how you show up and how you engage with everybody good dr cole all right so in the infamous words of one of my favorite colleagues what you permit you promote that's christina parl p-a-r-l-e if you don't know her find her and connect with her so what what we permit we promote the idea that we don't disengage we don't challenge here's the thing you can't be an advocate you can't be an ally unless you're willing to challenge other folks but that begins with also challenging yourself so we talked a lot about creative we talked about stair stepping we talked about equity and we talked about about the idea of creating those opportunities and starting with self, appreciate that. Here's what I want you to hear as well as we close out from me, how to unlearn awareness, coming into an awareness that you even have an issue, a problem. If this year, the 2020 was the first year that you learned about Juneteenth, start there. Number two, acknowledgement. Acknowledge that you have work to do. Acknowledge that there is not necessarily cultural competence because you are always growing, always learning. It's an ongoing process. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Number three, exploration and exposure. Don't get caught in confirmation bias. Don't get caught around and surrounded by people who think like you, who agree with you. Make sure that you're placing yourself and you're leaning into uncomfortability because we don't grow in comfort. And number four is commitment. I said earlier, a lot of folks making statements, but where is your commitment now? And that brings us to number five of ongoing effort, that it is an ongoing effort. We didn't get here overnight. We're not going to get right overnight. It requires sustainable effort, and it starts with each one of the professionals who is present in this space today, because you can't expect, to Tania's point, the students to do something that the professionals are not doing. Good. Fantastic. That was absolutely amazing. 
Um, we just want to first of all thank all of our panelists and speakers. Y'all did such a phenomenal job. Thank you all so much. Um, if you'd like to, again, if you'd like to book any of them or bring them to your campus, um, you know how to connect with them on LinkedIn. If you go up to the chat, we gave the LinkedIn information as well as the speaker interest form as well. Um, in addition to that, we have the Circular Change Leadership Conference. Again, that is coming up uh, very soon. I won't stop saying that because I know about the transformation that happens. And um, as I close out uh, this virtual masterclass that we've been talking about since June, uh, so we finally got here. I um, also want to uh, encourage you, we'll be doing more. Um, we have one coming up in the next three weeks which is going to deal with self-care, wellness, and uh, re reinvigorating, refreshing. Um, probably have some of the greatest motivational speakers that I know in the world. And I'm not just saying that I'm telling you uh, they're incredible. Trust me on that. But as I get ready to close, I do want to say this. Um, I just think the, the my, my theme, I think, is reimagine and recreate. I think it's a time of recreation. I think it's a time of reimagining. And I think there's three things that I hope you're able to take with you today. Number one, being a forward thinker. Um, being someone that's not only focused on the now, but is focused on the future. I often tell people, I don't want to flatten the curve. I want to be a head of the curve. And that requires forward thinking. Number two, I think, which is really, really, really essential is make sure that you are innovative. Make sure you are creative. Make sure you think outside the box. Make sure you're willing to think about things that are new and that are better. Um, things as things grow, they should get better. And what may have worked 50 years ago may not work today. And you got to be willing to be innovative. You got to be willing to think outside the box. And then lastly, I like to use the last thing is you got to be courageous. And I use the word courageous because you're going to have some courageous conversations. It's going to take some courage to let some stuff go. And for some of you that are truly going to be advocates and are truly going to be about change and are truly going to be about uh, equity and truly going to be about inclusion, you may have to lose some friends and some people may not like you no more in order to create the change that we know is right to create in the world. And so that takes courage. And the question is, are you willing to create the courage and to help someone out? There, I don't know. I'm, I think I'm talking to someone right now. And you're like, well, you don't understand. Well, let me tell you this. If you don't move, there's two things I want you to remember. Number one, there's someone that's going to be impacted because you didn't step out and do it. But number two, if you don't move, you will be replaced and someone else will do what you were purposed to do. So if you don't want to be in that position, be the person to create the change you wish to see. I want to thank y'all so much. It was an honor. It was a pleasure. Again, thank our panelists and uh, we'll see you in three weeks. Same place right here. Virtual Masterclass. Peace, y'all. We out.